Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Freedom to the Power of Four, Free Manufacturing Data with Apache PLC for X and MQDT. We'll kick off in a minute, but before we start, I want to give you a quick introduction. Um, so first of all, all participants are muted. However, you can ask questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A tab um, in your control panel. So um, yeah, there will be around 15 minutes Q&A and Florian and Chris try to answer all of your questions in the Q&A session. If we can't answer all of them, um, we will answer them on our hyphen Q community forum. The link will be shared with you afterwards. Additionally, we will also start a quick feedback poll during the Q&A session and would be very, very pleased if you could feedback um, yeah, on this webinar. And I also want to let you know that we will record the session and the recording will be shared with you afterwards. So this is everything you need to know right now. And yeah, I guess we can start. Um, now I'm happy to introduce you to today's speaker, Christopher and Florian. Uh, Christopher Dutz is a guest speaker today and he's a full-blooded open source enthusiast. Um, in 2017, he initiated the Apache PLC for X project and is one of the biggest contributors behind this project today. And also Florian Raschbichler, who is head of support at HiveMQ and has guided more than 120 customers from proof of concept to going to production. So welcome, Christopher and Florian. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, so I think let's just uh, get started. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so my name is uh, Christopher Dutz. Um, uh, sort of my entire life uh, sort of uh, plays around uh, the Apache Software Foundation. I'm currently committer in 30 projects there. Uh, it's sort of like infectious once you get started in uh, open source, uh, at least the way Apache does it, it sort of uh, tends to stick to you. Um, yeah, um, Florian, you want to say anything? Maybe I should unmute first. Uh, thank you, for, for Reina, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for Christopher. <coughs> thank you, Christopher, for joining us. My name is uh, Florian Raschbichler. Like Reina said, I run the technical support team uh, for HiveMQ. I'm a big enthusiast about uh, MQTT and specifically the MQTT uh, 5 version as well. And I'm yeah very very excited about uh, today's topics because uh, many of the challenges that uh, will be lined out, uh, I have seen them firsthand and um, it's great to have uh, solutions for them emerging and, uh, to people like Christopher uh, doing their open source thing. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, usually I uh, tweet a bit, uh, quite a bit uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, so uh, if you want to follow me, uh, Christopher Dutz, that's where I post all the, the dirty stuff in between. That's not an official project statement. So if you want to get all the intermediate fun, uh, just uh, follow me there. Um, so um, what's the current situation? Um, well, uh, we're talking about uh, automation and manufacturing. Uh, and here, uh, let's say the most important thing, nothing works without, is a PLC. Uh, for those of you who doesn't know what a PLC is, it's a programmable logic controller. It's sort of like a programmable circuit board that you can sort of turn on and off uh, inputs uh, or an outputs and measure inputs. Um, sort of like little computers that have very limited resources, but they have one really, really special thing that we on our Windows or Linux or Mac uh, machines don't know. Uh, they have real-time operation. So uh, that is as real-time as it can get. And uh, I have never ever seen a PLT actually crash. So these things are made to not crash. Um, currently in the industry, Everybody's talking about this industry 4.0. The buzzword isn't as uh, sort of uh, used as much as it was uh, two years ago, but it's still a, a pretty big thing. 
Uh, and in a lot of talks with uh, people from the industry, what they actually mean under, with uh, Industry 4.0, well, generally it boils down to uh, dashboards, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, if you drill down a bit more, what that actually means uh, is, well, in the end, it's all about data. So you gotta collect a lot of data on your machinery in order to do some machine learning, artificial intelligence, and whatnot. And uh, it's not just a few bytes, uh, it's a huge amount of data. We're talking uh, gigabytes of data per day. Um, I think in one proof of concept, we were talking about 29 gigabytes of data per second. So it might give you a little idea of what scale we're talking about. And uh, even if you might not think that in such a production environment, there is data everywhere. Um, right now, it's actually quite easy to access um, data on new PLCs. Uh, for that, there are currently two uh, streams that uh, I would uh, say are very dominant uh, on new PLCs. Uh, it's definitely OPC UA uh, and uh, MQTT. Uh, and we'll dig into what these two mean uh, in a second. So, yeah, well. I was talking about a second, so the second is passed. What is OPC UA? Um, it's a short form of OPC Unified Architecture. It's uh, defined uh, by the OPC Foundation. It's uh, a foundation in which I think every manufacturer of uh, industrial hardware and automation hardware is a part of that. Uh, and it's a standard and a protocol. Uh, it's um, sort of a, a standard and protocol for platform independent data exchange. Um, what, what it does more than uh, the other existing protocols, it also adds a sort of a service oriented architecture layer on top of it, and additionally defines a semantics of data. While uh, with my usual uh, industrial hardware, I just get sort of integer numbers and I have to make sense out of them on my own. With OPC UA, you actually get, well, this is a pressure value uh, with uh, in millibar and uh, has a range from A to B and has a current value of Z. Um, so it, it brings a lot more. Um, development time, yeah, well, as you can imagine, if a lot of people uh, have a saying in this, well, it took them about 10 years to develop. Uh, and a sort of final version was released uh, about two years ago. It was autumn two years ago. Um, that, that was when uh, OPC UA finally had some published subscribe support. Um, so isn't everything good? Well, not really. Um, first of all, OPC UA is a highly complex standard. Uh, it's not like if you just take a protocol like Modbus, you can sort of like hack it in a week. Um, OPC UA, it will take you months. It's, it's a very complex standard and has um, a lot of, uh, yeah, um, and it's difficult to, to, to get done right. So there are a lot of sometimes incompatible implementations, but even if the comp implementations would be uh, okay, uh, the semantics that OPC UA adds on top is the next uh, part of uh, conflict because uh, all of these standards uh, and administration shells, I think in Germany it's called Verwaltungsschale. Uh, the stupid thing is with standards is it gets difficult if you have too many of them. Uh, so right now every part of the industry tries to enforce their own um, administration shells and they are incompatible with each other. So now you just have incompatibility one layer higher. Um, OPC UA is really great for uh, accessing small amounts of data uh, for dashboards or logging or, or just telling another machine that this machine is still working. Um, but I would say it has an unacceptable performance when accessing large amounts of data. Uh, especially uh, if you need them at high frequencies. If you want to do machine learning, you don't, you you can't live with uh, a set of uh, information every few seconds. Well, you need at least every second or at max every two seconds uh, new values. If you try to do that, um, modern PLCs are usually overloaded. Maybe as a little example that I've seen in the wild uh, live, 
was um, Siemens has these really, really great PLCs, uh, the S7 devices, and the S7 400 is sort of their working horse. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a brutally uh, performant machine, but using OPC UA to access information on these, they shut down after asking for more than 200 data points every two seconds. Um, so you can see uh, getting the amount of data you need for machine learning, it's just not possible with OPC UA, not at the moment. Um, yeah, so uh, having done the OPC UA part, I'll hand over uh, to Florian. Yeah, uh, thank you, Christopher. So what's MQTT? Well, MQTT is an IoT messaging protocol which got initially actually invented in 1999 uh, by IBM for the purpose of monitoring oil pipelines. Um, then already in mind, of course, that it should be very lightweight in its implementation, should, should have reliable messaging, even when you have unreliable channels. And yeah, very small overhead um, in terms of bandwidth, as well as implementation on the client side. Um, of course, in 1999, nobody was doing IoT or no one even knew the, the term, uh, but uh, yeah. Many years later, um, it got it got some adoption in the IoT world already, um, so much so that in uh, 2012, it got uh, standardized um, on the OASIS for the first time. Um, we have three quality of service levels in, that are very crucial to MQTT in terms of message delivery guarantees. And uh, actually, we have here MQTT 5 is uh, well, it says here required, uh, at least it's really helpful for you for IIoT and uh, for maybe if you're wondering IIoT, so that's, uh, it used to be industry 4.0, then it was smart manufacturing for a while and it's now IIoT, which uh, it stands for industrial IoT. But uh, as Christopher pointed out, it's all about collecting data and, and, and working with it, just visualizing it and, 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 and so on. If you, Yes, um, we have a publish subscribe pattern always uh, in MQTT. So we have clients that connect to a central server or broker and that uh, could communicate over so-called so topics with one another. Uh, the beautiful thing or one of the beautiful things about MQTT is that these topics are highly dynamic. Uh, you don't have to configure them beforehand like you, know, you would know from other message queuing uh, technologies. And the protocol was really designed in a way that all of the complicated features are implemented on the broker. So really in mind to have a very lightweight, small implementation on the client side, which allows uh, for having even yeah, modern PLCs already speak, uh, speak MQTT. Uh, naturally. What are the advantages of publishing of the publish and subscribe uh, paradigm? Of course, uh, we have decoupling between sender and receiver of messages uh, in space and time and in synchronization uh, with the with the topic structure that is so dynamic and open in MQTT, you can do really cool filtering logic even already uh, with the topics. So for the receiving clients, uh, they don't have to parse any messages uh, as long as you use enough topics for that. And we have push communication. So yeah, basically real time uh, data transfer fair. And maybe one more thing I I'd like to add here. Um, what so far is uh, still a little bit missing uh, in MQTT is the, the data structure and the and topic st structure that, that you don't have, but this is, all, this is already being addressed and uh, who's interested in this, there's a standard coming up that's called Spark Plug that is uh, specifically also designed uh, yeah, for, the, for the industrial IoT and that will cover many of these, um, yeah, let's say blind spots that are there right now and, and hopefully create a, a standardized payload format for PLCs um, in the near future. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so I'll just take over from here. Uh, so why don't we just uh, sort of like concentrate on MQTT? It sort of sounds like uh, the ideal um, technology for collecting data uh, on modern PLCs. Well, uh, in this sentence, I already mentioned the problem on modern PLCs. I said uh, OPC UA uh, was available for the last two years. I would say that MQTT is gaining more and more momentum, but I think you have been able to get MQTT enabled PLCs for about one to one and a half years. And the thing is, uh, industrial hardware is usually built for lifespans of 20 years. So what do you do? Uh, as soon as a new technology comes out, you just rip it apart and replace all of the PLCs in your machine. Well, that's usually not going to happen. So uh, if we just assume a lifespan of two, 20 years, uh, well, 5% of machinery is uh, replaced every year. Uh, so let's just uh, say for two years, every PLC that has been sold uh, supports MQTT. Well, even in this case, which is very uh, unlikely, uh, well, we still have a maximum of 90% uh, of 10% uh, that support MQTT right now. So what do we do with the remaining 90%? And that's where, uh, yeah, I think we, we, we had the slides. I think we mixed this uh, one should have been one just the last slipped one. down. <laughs> yeah, just uh, pointing out, um, even though initially um, developed by IBM, MQTT is a full open standard now. Um, it's, it's an ISO standard as well as um, has the OASIS and an OASIS technical committee behind it that consists of many of the users and many of the vendors uh, using MQTT, HiveMQ, also IBM or other big companies are part of, of that committee and uh, yeah, there's periodic feedback gathering and improvements uh, done to the protocol. The latest version MQTT5 has been officially released just last year. Yeah, and this is also the first degree of freedom, uh, freedom like uh, open and free standards. So we will still be seeing three more freedom uh, degrees. So, um, so how, how does the industry currently solve this problem of having uh, more than 90% of the machinery that they just can't connect via uh, MQTT or OPC UA? Well, um, the problem is uh, these devices have been developed in a world in which they weren't meant to talk to each other. So there are hundreds, if not even thousands of different protocols. These protocols are generally incompatible with each other. And sometimes even the, the implementation of the same protocol is incompatible with each other. Um, most have absolutely no security. I, I think a, a lot of people from the IT world can't even imagine how insecure these PLCs are built from a software security point of view. Um, my S7 devices, uh, I can do whatever I want with them without needing a password. So as soon as you get a network connection to a PLC, well, you can generally uh, imagine it's, it's compromised. Uh, some protocols even send admin passwords in clear text over the wire. Um, so it's really uh, something you can't just plug in a, a network cable and connect it to a cloud. Well, you, you can do that, but uh, I would definitely suggest not to do that. Um, yeah, um, especially when um, when it comes to OPC UA, well, as I mentioned, the, the performance is absolutely unacceptable if you want lots of data at high frequencies. Um, what does the industry currently do? Well, there are a lot of uh, integration platforms and these platforms, they have been existing since the early 90s. Uh, I think uh, the, the most prominent one, uh, at least the one I always hear when I'm at a, a customer is called uh, Capware. Um, these are extremely expensive and I'm not just talking a few hundred or a few thousand uh, euros, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of euros. Uh, they are usually built as monoliths. So another thing I've heard quite often is when I suggest, well, why don't we co connect all of these devices you have here uh, to your capware? Well, usually it says, they say, yeah, well, uh, yeah, our capware doesn't scale. Uh, so if we connect all of these, uh, well, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, they are built as monoliths. 
Um, another alternative, well, is to use commercial drivers. Um, those were the first I had a look uh, at. Um, and uh, I was really amazed that people are really willing to pay up to 4,000 euros per node to use a driver. So every data collection, every edge device, you have to pay 4,000 euros in order to be able to access uh, your PLC data. There are a few open source drivers, um, but they are usually very old projects. Uh, some of them are not even maintained anymore. Uh, a lot of them you can even see how they were ported from uh, ANSI C uh, languages uh, to, uh, to, to Java because uh, they have all these static calls and uh, method names with uh, underscores in them. Uh, and one thing that really bothers me is even the half good ones are implemented in a way that on multi-core machines, you can r have really dangerous situations of race conditions in your memory. Um, the other alternative uh, is to use hardware gateways. These can be um, dedicated PLCs that don't have any uh, hardware attached to them. They just act as a protocol uh, translator, or you have dedicated protocol adapters or gateways. But the problem uh, with these is they add extra costs, they add extra maintenance, uh, and uh, it's just pretty, it's still pretty expensive. So what's my solution to this problem? Well, uh, let me introduce uh, Apache plc for x So what is plc for x Well, it's generally a set of libraries for communicating with industrial programmable logic controllers. Um, but in contrast to other solutions is that even if we use a variety of protocols, we do have one shared API. And I think that's one thing I haven't seen in any uh, other project, not even the commercial drivers. Usually the driver dictates the API. Uh, in our case, we defined an API and all drivers uh, have to uh, sort of uh, operate with this. Um, what operations do we support? Well, one thing I should mention is you can't do everything you can do with protocol X. You can't do everything uh, with Apache PLC for X because PLC for X isn't made for uh, programming PLCs. It's not made for uh, maintenance jobs, uh, for backing up PLC programs or whatever. It's made for accessing data. And that's why the API is held pretty simple. Uh, we can read stuff, we can write stuff, we can subscribe to data. Uh, here we can uh, do on value change uh, subscriptions, we can uh, have uh, cyclic uh, subscriptions, or we can uh, react on alarms and events. Uh, it always depends on the protocol. Uh, for example, Modbus just doesn't support events, so we can't uh, offer events on that protocol. Um, work has just started on browsing, so uh, you will be able to more and more uh, be able to co connect to a PLC and sort of just list up what resources it has to provide. This will be uh, sort of uh, a bit limited because uh, if you just, uh, if you have a Modbus uh, PLC, for example, and you connect to that, that's just a huge pile of bytes just lying around. Uh, so you can't sort of extract any uh, details on what the data means if you don't know what it is. There might be some approaches with machine learning that might be able to figure out some things, but generally uh, browse support will be pretty limited. Um, and last not least, we ha will have the feature to execute code. This is more thought uh, for, um, for example, if you want to bring a machine into a maintenance mode or a clean mode where it's sort of like, drives into some special position where they can clean things or replace some parts. Uh, but that hasn't been started to work on. That's why there is a red X on it. I have been mentioning protocols. Well, this is the, the main thing of uh, PLC for X, uh, being able to talk in protocols. And so far we implemented uh, quite a large set, generally the S7 and the ADS protocol. Uh, Modbus and OPC UA have been gaining more and more momentum. Ethernet IP is sort of more in the US American uh, area uh, where uh, there are some companies currently uh, evaluating uh, our Ethernet IP support. <coughs> um, 
If you want to play around with something cheap, well, buy an Arduino and play around with Fermata. Um, I particularly implemented the KNX NetIP uh, in order to be able to talk to my house. And just recently, um, one of our contributors uh, started working hard on CAN and uh, that has just been merged uh, into the main repository. Then we have a lot of protocols we are currently working on. That's especially the Alan Bradley uh, protocols, Bucknet, uh, Amazon Delta V. That's a pretty raw thing. Uh, so a lot of work has to be put into that. Luxtronic, that's sort of... Uh, not home automation, but I need that to talk to my geothermal heating, for example. And then there are some protocols like the Siemens S7 TIA protocol, the new one. We would be able to implement a driver, but the problem is uh, we wouldn't be allowed to do that because they have uh, they had have a little trick uh, in their protocol that uh, just currently renders it uh, useless for us uh, to implement in uh, without being sued. Uh, one protocol that we will probably start working on soon is uh, Profinet. And uh, this is a little different because that is really not no longer on the SCADA level, but on the field bus level. Uh, so with this, we will be able to talk to sensors directly. Another thing, we called it PLC4X and not PLC4J because uh, it was never intended to be just supported in Java, even if it was for the first two or three years, generally in Java, it was always our goal to bring drivers to different languages. Ah, damn it, I, I, I missed the, the, the second degree of freedom. <laughs> well, uh, this is the third degree of freedom, uh, the, the freedom uh, to choose uh, what whatever a platform protocol you want to use. Um, so right now, well, we support Java. Uh, recent, I just yesterday I merged uh, our Go drivers for uh, KNX and Modbus uh, back to develop, and that's probably going to be released in a week or so. Um, in parallel, I'm working hard on C. That's more uh, intended for embedded devices, and the community is working hard on Python. We already have APIs for C Sharp and C++. Uh, but we're currently lacking a bit of community support to, uh, com uh, to, to work on these. Um, yeah, uh, the fourth uh, freedom, uh, that's my favorite one. It's uh, freedom like in free beer, because uh, it's just free. Um, you have one API uh, for all the drivers uh, and uh, you can write one piece of uh, software that can handle any type of machinery. Now, this might sound not that great, but uh, we, usually, we recently had multiple use cases where a company that has factories in a lot of co uh, countries had the problem that, for example, in Europe, they were using Siemens devices. Now, Siemens doesn't uh, sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of not, a lot of US American companies uh, don't, use Siemens devices, they use their American uh, brands. So they had the problem that all over the world, they were using Siemens and in the US they had different devices. So they had to rewrite their software for the US. But the cool thing is with plc for x all you need to do is just uh, slip in a new driver and change the configuration file and you can use the same thing. Uh, another thing is you don't need to re retrofit your existing machinery. As I said, OPC UA, it promises universal communication, but the stupid thing is you need to update your PLC in order to support that. And you don't need any license costs. Um, for example, uh, in my demo factory, which I'll be showing in a, in a minute, um, there is a Siemens device that has OPC UA support, but it's not enabled because I wasn't willing to pay the 400 bucks uh, to enable that. And probably the most impressive thing I think uh, with PLC4X is our passive mode drivers. Uh, these allow reading data without actually sending a single byte into a secure network. This is particularly interesting if you have some high security areas where you're, if you, if you wanna make data available to your scientists, but you're not allowed to have them access the network. Well, our passive mode drivers, they're the perfect thing for this. Um, let me give you a little example. Uh, we, we say it's secure by design because you just can't send a byte to the network, so you can't really mess up anything. Um, 
we, we intercept a read request and a read response and uh, we know what this value uh, is in the secure network. Um, it's 100% secure. And the cool thing is there is no need to validate or certify these drivers. And this is, that has been a, a huge problem in the past because uh, a lot of the people uh, from the OT departments, they just don't let you access uh, their machinery if you don't have certified drivers. So now we can just say, yeah, well, as we can't interse uh, in interact with the machinery at all anyway, well, we can't break anything, so we don't need to um, validate these drivers. Um, as you can see here in this picture, I hope you can see my mouse, there's this little diode. It's sort of, it's our idea that um, it would be great if there was a network device that would uh, allow us to only read and not send any uh, bit of data. It turned out it wasn't, it wasn't that easy to find any of these devices. I found some, they were military grade and usually uh, had a price tag of uh, starting at four to 5,000 euros per device. Um, but I thought just that just can't be. And on a meetup, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, the, I think it was the CEO of uh, Wiesemann and Theis. Um, and I was talking to him about this problem. And the funny thing is he was so impressed by this idea that the next day I got a call by his uh, uh, development engineer. Yeah, well, and they built this thing. Uh, they built this data diode uh, for us. Uh, it's called Fixed Defined Firewall. Uh, you can't configure anything with it. You just have two network sockets and uh, well, data flows from one direction to the other, but not in the other. Um, and uh, with 700 bucks, uh, it's a lot more affordable. Yeah, and another thing that I r ran into quite a lot of times and which sort of hindered us from going uh, from a proof of concept to uh, a big project a, a lot of times was everybody was thinking there is no commercial support. They need commercial support if you want to use something in production. And generally for open source, it's uh, the thing is, if it's open source, you can't sort of have somebody stay up at night and fix your problems if you don't pay him for it. Uh, and to close this gap, um, a few people around the Apache PLC for X project and other Apache projects, uh, we joined forces and created something called industrial-opensource.com. And these 14 companies uh, behind the contributors um, formed an alliance uh, for providing commercial support for IoT open source projects um, and generally services that the current the, the industry is currently uh, lacking quite a bit, especially training and workshops, consulting, even implementation work, but most importantly, technical support. So if a driver doesn't work, well, uh, you can uh, get commercial support uh, for getting things fixed. And last not least, uh, legal consulting. So using open source uh, does bring up some legal uh, questions. So um, we also have some lawyers in this group uh, that can uh, give you qualified advice in this. So for me, uh, the perfect match is definitely Apache plc for x for all the existing and old machines and MQTT for the new and upcoming devices together it's just a, a perfect thing. So, demo time. I hope now's the part where I'm getting sweaty hands and getting a bit nervous. Um, so, what do we want to do today? Well, uh, behind me, I have this little Fischer Technik uh, Industry 4.0 factory. And uh, unfortunately, uh, only this uh, part in the upper left uh, corner is uh, finished. Um, you can see down here, it's, uh, it's a sorting lane. It, uh, you, you insert colored chips on one side over here and it passes through a color sensor and it ejects uh, into different shoots depending on the color. Um, as you can see underneath the table, I have a, a wide variety of different PLCs. Uh, the one we're interested in this time is the Siemens S7 um, here. And what we want to do now is uh, I want to use Apache plc for x to collect data from my S7 device and pump that into a HiveMQ broker. 
and you all can uh, sign in and see this data uh, flowing past uh, your screen uh, live. So in order to do that, I would like to ask you to go to HTTP double, uh, yeah, uh, hivemq.com demos WebSocket client. And there uh, connect to the host uh, broker hivemq.com and enter the port 8000. And as soon as you're in there, I'll just uh, switch over to, uh, uh, you'll uh, get a screen like this and uh, then just uh, subscribe, uh, ah, it was over here. I'll just remove the subscription so I can just do it new. Uh, so I just add a new subscription, click on subscribe. And then there is here this uh, little window for um, for incoming messages. Just uh, just a quick, uh, so, so the, the address that's already in there, that's, that also works. So you can just go to the website and click connect and you will already be on the right broker. Okay. And here you can see uh, the live feed uh, of my factory. And I'm gonna dive underneath my uh, green screen and uh, try to insert some stuff. So uh, this is the part where I get nervous. Nervous for a reason. I have to refresh this camera. No, oh, come on. Okay. Now the shoots are empty. <laughs> and does it work now? Yeah, this looks better. So the people uh, sending yeah. yeah, it should start the program. That does help. <laughs> I see some people sending empty publishers. Uh, yeah, I, to, I didn't do a start subscription the on the demo the, program, the top, so uh, there currently the wasn't right. any connection. So let me start this. Okay, so now it should start streaming. Okay. Um, such as are coming in. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can even see uh, that little glitch because uh, uh, the stupid thing is if you program your color sensor in the middle of the night, it works differently than uh, when you have some bright lights from your webcam setup uh, shining. Uh, so I'm still tweaking a little on the, the, the numeric values, but you can even see the value that is triggering if it's a red, green, or blue uh, in the color sensor value. And that should be wiggling a bit because uh, it's sort of like, depending on how much light is currently going in, um, it should uh, provide a different value. Yeah, okay. So I'm happy in the end it did work. Turning off the demo. So I think we're good in time. So are there any questions? Yes. Let's go over to Q and A. So there is right now one question from Xavier. Um, he asks, where does it run at the PLC? Uh, it doesn't run at all. Uh, it just uses the protocols the PLCs natively support and it just talks to the servers. Uh, so you do need a piece of software where it runs, but that really depends if you, you um, if it's a Java program, well, you use PLC4J. If it's some embedded device, low profile device, you can probably uh, have better results with PLC4Go. If you can, um, I'm even working on running it on super minimal uh, embedded hardware 
uh, using a PLC4C. So um, you do need a computer where your program runs on, but you don't need an agent on, um, on the device you're talking to. Um, so, um, Jose asked how to get the slides or code to practice. So you will, um, you will get a follow up, um, email afterwards and we will put in the link to the slides as well. And the code, uh, is in the example section of the PLC for X repository. It's called, uh, hello MQTT, I think. We could also send a link to that in the follow up mail. Um, so one participant asks, um, it can run on IOT and edge device also. Yes. Okay. So and, and I would uh, definitely, uh, suggest not to run it in the cloud. It would run on some cloud services, but for security reasons, I would strongly suggest not to do that. So um, Roland Schmidt says MQTT version five is required was on one of the slides. What are the arguments for this? I think that is one for Florian. Yeah. So like I, like I said, when talking about the slide, um, I think required is not necessarily the exact term here, but uh, recommended. Uh, there's a number of features that MQTT five introduced that could be really uh, useful for I IoT, um, namely uh, things as the user properties, uh, topic aliases can be really helpful when using long topic names in, in high frequent data exchange. That's a feature that would allow the client to exchange um, yeah, a topic name basically for an integer in negotiation with the broker. And um, yeah, there's a, just a number of smaller features actually that really lend itself to the to IIoT space. Um, also something like will delay or um, another another feature that I, that I think of or less so a feature and more so a, a foundational change is that the MQTT protocol has been much more descriptive in terms of return codes and uh, negative acknowledgements. So when something goes wrong, uh, it can be much clearer, I identified much more clearly what went wrong. So these are some some of the arguments that I would have um, to, to going to MPD5. But I'm also aware that, um, so sometimes you just don't have the choice because the even the newer devices that, they, that might support MQTT might not necessarily be at MQTT5 support at this point in time. Yeah, and maybe maybe I should add uh, what I really like with MQTT five is uh, the ability to work with uh, not that stable network connection. So all this sort of if my wireless connection for my uh, device out in the field sort of like drops out, uh, well, it sort of buffers things, and as soon as the connection is back, uh, it flushes things. Uh, I think that wasn't uh, possible with three, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Oh, that's, okay. that, 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 that should be available. Th that's, uh, so that's uh, um, down to the specific implementation of the client. So not, not, not every client has that, but some clients have that also for MQTT3. All right. Um, so Jörg asked, which connectors would you recommend for production use? Um, well, I, I'm uh, the, the OPC right uh, one is uh, pretty solid. Uh, the S7, the ADS, the Modbus, uh, that has uh, sort of uh, got a lot of traction, especially in the Asian uh, area. They do a lot of Modbus over there. And these drivers have improved greatly, but I would strongly suggest not to, uh, to, to give us a week or two to release the OAO version, because uh, we did fix quite a lot of uh, little bugs. Because the 070 was the first version where we generated all of our code. 
So we built a, a, a framework to generate all of the, uh, or let's say 90% of the driver code from a specification file. Uh, so the, the 070 is sort of a beta. Um, the 080 will be the first uh, rock solid one uh, in the, the new terms or uh, go to the 061 version, I think. Uh, that was the, the last of the, the old style drivers. Um, so, but generally, uh, if you're in the ADS, uh, S7, Modbus, and OPC UA area, um, you should be good to go. All right. So I found one question. Uh, what, where was it again? So one anonymous participant asks, I don't really understand the advantage of PLC4X. It is not only a middleware software like OPC or UA, right? Uh, OPC UA is not a middleware software. Uh, it's 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 a library. It, it's sort of it's not even a software on its own. It's a, it's a library with which you can build software. So in one case, uh, in this case, for example, I I just created a little program that uh, collects data uh, via a PLC for X and sends it out via MQTT. But uh, we, we also integrated in uh, Apache Ka uh, Kafka Connect, for example, uh, uh, or um, I think there is a, a Logstash uh, adapter to integrate it uh, into uh, other systems. Uh, you, I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a library for communicating with uh, industrial hardware, but we also put a lot of effort into integration modules to allow it to integrate it into modern open source uh, solutions. Uh, and I think that's one major difference to most of the commercial stuff. If you're looking for an integration into a Project X, well, you will probably not find it. Okay. Um, so Kun Song asks, is there a need of the sensors to talk this protocol to a Hive MQ? Um, I think uh, use cases that currently are coming up uh, are that if you start, well, they, they, the industry likes to call it artificial intelligence. I call it smart dashboards or smart programs, even machine learning. Uh, you tend to notice things. Uh, for example, one of the first things I usually do if I come to a company and they want to do some uh, optimization of their production uh, is not to talk to any PLC, but to talk to the person uh running the machine and if he tells me well i always put my hand on top of this machine uh, and as soon as it starts vibrating i know it needs service uh, but if there is no sensor to uh, collect this data uh, what do you do then uh, if you buy one of the cheap uh, iot uh, experimental sensors well they will probably break within weeks uh, or you buy a rock solid one but they usually speak industrial protocol. So if you can speak Profinet to this simple uh, vibration sensor, uh, it's way better to buy a commercial uh, vibration sensor and just talk to it in Profinet. All right. Um... Leo Kistner asks, the passive mode PLC for X driver can listen to all interaction. Are the PLC protocols not encrypted, etc.? No, no, they are absolutely not encrypted. Uh, the only part where I've seen encryption uh, was in the uh, Siemens uh, TIA protocol that I mentioned. And there they don't even use it to protect information, just to protect their uh, IP. Um, so uh, all, all crypto I've seen in that uh, was a simple hash. Uh, I would say OPC UA, there is a, a, an SSL encrypted uh, mode of OPC UA, but all of the others uh, I haven't seen. Nothing encrypted. Okay. Um, Mike Fornet asks, is it meant that M... What is, is it meant the MQTT will replace PLC for X? Is it meant, I, I think he means, is it meant that MQTT will replace PLC for X? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, well, it's not meant that, it's, it will be MQTT, but uh, we do know that uh, ideally uh, PLC for X will be around for about 19 years at maximum. Uh, and then we, 
uh, all of the industrial hardware is already communicating nicely with each other. Uh, and there will be no need for PLC for X, but uh, there's still a few years uh, till that will happen. Um. Maybe Falk's question. Um, Falk Flessel. Oh, okay. Found it. Um, so Falk Flessel asks. It does not run on ARM devices, right? Uh, I think. Uh, isn't an Arduino an ARM device? Uh, nice. I, think I think it does so. run uh, as soon as uh, as soon as you've got uh, as soon as you've got a Java runtime running on it. You can use PLC for J. Uh, there is nothing that would prevent you from using PLC for C uh, on an ARM device. Uh, I think Go is Go. If Go is available on ARM, well, you can use that too. Python, you can definitely use. Uh, well, but that has to be finished first. That that was actually not the question I was referring to, Verena, but also a good question. Oh, one moment. Then I'm searching for the other one. No. Ah. There are so many questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, Do you want me to read it? Uh, yeah. If you find one that is. Yeah. So, Falk Fressel uh, oh, wants okay. to know can you browse the UPC UA nodes? If so, have you noticed performance issues on the PLC? Browsing stresses <laughs> PLCs very yeah. much. Yeah, well, if you're using OPC UA, yes, I have noticed uh, performance issues on the PLC because that's what OPC UA does best, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, joke, uh, joke aside, um, I have to admit the OPC UA uh, driver, I'm not that involved in. Uh, we're using, uh, that's also the only driver we're actually relying on uh, the Milo driver. I think it was the Milo driver uh, from Eclipse uh, to uh, bring that functionality. Uh, they have been working on the browse functionality, but I have to admit, uh, lacking any OPC UA device, uh, I haven't tried it out, I have to admit. Oh, okay, now, now I think I found all of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe regarding the, the Beckhoff PLC demo? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the uh, the backoff device uh, it's already connected fully, but uh, I haven't uh, implemented uh, the backoff uh, PLC program. Uh, this is always a little thing that's a little difficult for an IT guy like me. Uh, writing software for these PLCs it feels really, really awkward and strange, and I haven't sort of managed to finish that. But I just recently did some tests uh, as uh, I was doing some testing of our data types. And one thing I noticed was the test suite run on a, a Beckhoff ADS uh, driver uh, under a second. On an S7 device, it took uh, almost four seconds. Uh, and on a Modbus device, we're up to 12 seconds. So that may be a little uh, information on the performance. So right now, I think uh, the best performance I've seen uh, comes from a Beckhoff PLC. So the, the back of was, is there any demo for back of PLC to speak? Um, <laughs> um, so one question by Martin Lungeshausen. Do you get your timestamps from the PLC or do you create it with PLC for X before you send it to the broker? Uh, it depends on the protocol. There are protocols that send the timestamps with them um but most of them don't um so mostly uh, we generate the timestamps on the edge device that runs plc for x um but if a protocol supports that uh, we we take theirs i think a bucknet for example sends a, a timestamp and we're using that um but let me just think maybe opc or a has timestamps in them but as far as i can think the others don't even send timestamps with them 
So we have one question by Deepali Koti, who is asking, what is the actual role of HyphenQ? I'm guessing in, in this demo, uh, you want to scroll back to that slide, um, Christopher? Um, yeah, wait, wait a second. But uh, it, it, its role is um, that of an MQTT broker. So the uh, PLC 4X collects the data from the PLCs uh, from the factory, forwards it as MQTT to the hyphen Q broker. And then from there, everybody could um, use the hyphen Q demo client to subscribe and get the data. So it's pretty. It probably would have been cool if I had uh, my Vago device, for example, uh, configured correctly, because then we could have had an arrow from that device just going directly to HiveMQ. Um, but uh, I, I couldn't manage to finish setting that up. Um, I just got it uh, last week. Uh, so uh, that was sort of like not in the time just, frame. There's a question about a free of charge demo of PLC4X, but it's it's open <laughs> yeah, source, right? Yeah, yeah, that's available. It's on GitHub. <laughs> yeah. There are actually a few questions about the demo, about um, if it's possible to use this protocol, where they could start learn about this protocol. Well, let me just uh, fly through. Uh, um, yeah, should I just start at the top, or, or uh, um, I'd... yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I have the, this question from uh, Mohamed Hamsra uh, about um, if it's possible to make data available on Android. Uh, yes, but you will need a, an intermediate piece of software. Uh, so there must be uh, the Edge device maybe has a web server and that communicates uh, or even uh, it just connects to the HiveMQ broker and collects data from that. That should be the probably easiest way to get uh, data on your Android app. Um, um, there are some questions regarding if it's uh, possible to set inputs and outputs uh, and send commands to the PLCs. Yes, that is possible. Um, I can uh, explicitly uh, turn on and off uh, uh, inputs and uh, outputs uh, on my PLCs, but it really depends a bit on the, the, the device. Um, yeah okay so i guess we have time for one last question maybe the maturity of the can implementation mm, yes Christopher. how very, major very, is the can uh, and uh, as far as i understood uh, lukas uh, who is uh, implementing this uh, it is a pretty new and a bit fragile uh, construct, but it, that's more uh, due to the nature of uh, CAN. Um, I think he's also using open, CAN open, I think, uh, to do the communication. Um, so there's a little abstraction layer in that. All right. Okay, so we I think this webinar has come to an end. So thank you very much for joining us today. I'm gonna send you like all the links um, yeah, to the to our YouTube channel where we will upload this webinar and also all the links that you requested um, tomorrow in a follow-up. We would be very, very happy if you will join our next webinar in December. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Christopher and Florian for your presentation. I Thanks, hope Patrick. you all enjoyed it. Yeah, Thank and you, if uh, you want to get started, well, uh, the Apache PLC4X project has a plc4x.apache.org. Uh, there we have a, some, if you want to get started, uh, have some documentation there and our mailing list, uh, it's also on the website. So would be a pleasure uh, to reading some of you. <laughs> all right, thanks. Bye. Bye.